Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Pembroke Papers is uh, sort of traditionally talking about your research. Um, my research is in numerical methods for designing nuclear reactors, but I uh, figured that probably wouldn't have such a broad appeal, and it, uh, it's, it's also hard to make a provocative title out of. So instead, I'm talking about something which I feel maybe a bit more strongly about, even than numerical methods, is <laughs> facts about nuclear reactors. Um, because I sort of very frequently find myself lamenting when, I, when I'm talking to people, uh, misunderstandings which I think to myself would, would very easily be solved with some very simple facts and figures. But um, it's, uh, I think it's a problem that the nuclear industry has had for a very long time, that it's very bad at communicating this sort of thing. So the aim of this talk is hopefully to try and uh, change some of your preconceptions about nuclear, um, both in sort of the risks that it might pose to health and also as to why it's probably quite important for the future. So first, I'll be talking about the risks that nuclear poses. And I would like to ask the question, what is people's biggest concern if a nuclear reactor was built down the road? Chernobyl. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what I anticipated. <laughs> so, the question, what are these two pictures showing? Well, I'm glad you said that as well, because on the left we have Chernobyl, of course. On the right, actually, it's the first picture that comes up when you look for Google Images for Fukushima, which is paradoxically a, uh, a Chinese oil refinery. Um, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not quite sure why that is. Maybe it, uh, it looks a bit more interesting when it's billowing smoke and it's got sort of alien, sort of uh, spherical kind of um, buildings. But the question is, um, well, both of these reactors, ex nuclear reactors, explosively disassembled themselves and uh, spread out lots of radioactive isotopes into the atmosphere, like so much that we can detect them. Well, we could have detected them even here, um, particularly the likes of uh, very highly radioactive iodine. And um, the question is, uh, well, this is obviously ethically, it's awful. We've put stuff into the environment that wasn't there before and shouldn't be there. But the question is, um, how has this, this impacted us? How has it actually impacted the environment? And this is sort of where I would like to pause before addressing that because um, I, this talk is about misconceptions. And uh, I've come to understand that a lot of people, their knowledge of nuclear is determined by uh, groups which provide information which is not necessarily without slant. So throughout the talk, um, I've included a couple of slides which contain Greenpeace facts. These facts are uh, very convenient in that they're distinctly different from true facts. <laughs> so the, uh, the first of these is it's quite self-explanatory. Um, Chernobyl has caused 200,000 deaths, and the worst effects are still to come, presumably alluding to all the leukemia that's going to spring up and the, the birth defects and things like that. Um, in the opposite corner, we have the World Health Organization and the United Nations uh, Scientific Council for the Effects of Atomic Radiation. And um, these guys say that the iodine in particular, it's, it's sort of the most, the most uh, radioactive and the most prominent component of any nuclear kind of fallout that, that would happen. The iodine has been responsible for causing 9,000 to 16,000 cases of thyroid cancer. This is because the human body, when exposed to iodine, it'll preferentially take it up and deposit it in the thyroid. This is terrible, obviously, but um, I, or thyroid cancer is actually surprisingly immensely survivable as far as cancers go, in that with 16,000 cases of thyroid cancer, you'll get 160 people dying. Again, every death that happens, it's awful and it shouldn't be the case that it is happening. But you compare this to, say, coal when it's going right, as opposed to Chernobyl, which was the worst accident that could possibly happen for a nuclear reactor. Coal and air pollution and things like that, I think it was only published this week. Uh, it's estimated to kill 9 million people across the world every year, as opposed to a once, well, so far, once in Chernobyl's case, I will say once every 60 years kind of thing. Um, on as well as that, as well as 
they're only actually having been turned out to be 50 deaths that we can reliably say have happened as a result of Chernobyl. Um, there has never ever been any detected birth defects or genetic defects with people who have been exposed to even relatively large amounts of radiation. Um, however, the, the true sort of humanitarian crisis that has resulted from Chernobyl is actually the mental health effects. Um, a lot of people in the sort of Ukraine area and certainly surrounding Chernobyl, they have become depressed. There has been increased instances of suicide and alcoholism. And um, this, is, this is terrible, but it's interesting in that the uh, Greenpeace number I quoted, it, um, it was derived from obtaining uh, any instances of increased sort of mortality above the expected rate in that region um, since Chernobyl. And a lot of those deaths have been due to liver cirrhosis. Um, there's no actual mechanism for radiation causing liver cirrhosis, but alcohol can do it. And this alcohol, I mean, this alcoholism that's resulted, it's because these people think they're doomed, they're going to get leukemia, their children are doomed. And in actuality, that's absolutely not the case, and it's been shown not to be the case. So who's responsible for that? Um, I blame Greenpeace. <laughs> if we then look at uh, Fukushima, um, it was, well, for a start, it released a lot less radiation than Chernobyl, but um, also people were exposed to a lot less radiation simply because, as opposed to Soviet Russia where, or Soviet Ukraine, where no one was told anything and you know, people were happy to drink the milk that had been setting out when the explosion happened and hang around for three days while it was billowing smoke, people in Fukushima, they stayed inside and closed the windows. As a result, their exposure to radiation over, over that period of time was the same as if you lived in Cornwall for a year. Um, however, uh, yeah, and because this is so, obviously this is quite a small amount of radiation to receive, no one is expected to die additionally as a result of this. However, still we see people killing themselves and being depressed and uh, it's, um, it's pretty catastrophic. Um, there was then, of course, the, the subsequent evacuation that, that happened in a, a, a very large sort of I think it was about 40 mile radius around Fukushima. Um, the rush and the chaos and the panic that resulted from this move, um, it killed a lot of people. A lot of these people were elderly or sick that couldn't be moved from hospital or couldn't be moved quickly enough from hospital, such that they you know, weren't given food, weren't given water, weren't given heat. Uh, I, th I remember hearing one story about a bunch of old people essentially left to die in a bus that was abandoned. And it's, it's things like this which uh, um, obviously, there are far more banal but much riskier things than radiation, uh, contrary to our expectations. Um, so, um, such that one good example is that if you were a cleanup worker in Chernobyl, your expected decrease in lifetime is less than if, if you lived and worked in London. Um, because, you know, air pollution, it's actually much worse. Uh, in the extreme case, if you were within one and a half kilometers of the Hiroshima bomb when it went off, provided you survived the, uh, the thermal radiation and the pressure waves, which is no mean feat, I gather, um, then your estimated decrease in lifetime is two and a half years. Compare this to being morbidly obese, where you lose 10 years. So the point I'm trying to drive home is that nuclear, even in the worst case scenario, is actually pretty safe. Um, and I hope that this graph will sort of cement that because uh, <laughs> <laughs> this shows that, um, <laughs> well, this was found from calculating or and estimating all deaths attributable to a given energy resource like coal or solar and dividing it by all of the energy that it's ever produced. Um, so yeah, nuclear, it, it's looking pretty good from this, but I, I should add the disclaimer that this number is for the US nuclear fleet. It doesn't include Chernobyl. If you include Chernobyl, it goes up to 0.09. So it's still four times less risky than installing solar panels on your roof. <laughs> so the next, uh, presume, I hope, maybe I've covered safety. We'll say for now I have. What is the next big concern that people might have about nuclear plants? Excellent, yes. <laughs> you guessed it exactly. So when you put fuel into a nuclear reactor, waste comes out. Um, and as we have long been told, there is no solution for this waste. Um, however, 
Um, every energy resource is, um, it makes waste. You know, coal, it goes straight out the chimney. Solar and wind, they, surprisingly maybe, they do actually make waste. But nuclear is quite unique in that, well, we're talking about it right now. Like, nuclear waste is such a prominent thing. It's that in the industry, you have to consider it from when you mine the fuel out of the ground, when you build a reactor, to when you take the fuel out, to when you uh, dismantle the reactor. But um, yeah, I would say we're doing, personally, I would say we're doing a pretty all right job. And I say this because, well, first, you've put your fuel into a reactor, you've used it up, you take it out, and in the US, at least, it goes into these dry storage casks. This is full of spent fuel. It's full of uranium and plutonium and fission products. And yet these people can stand within a meter of it. I'm sure they can stand there for at least a month before being told, yeah, maybe, maybe back off. But these things, you will not get any radiation dose from them. And they are really bloody impenetrable. There is a fantastic video. I would have included it were it not for time. There's a fantastic video of back in the 1960s, we'll say, when the US were designing these dry storage flasks. They crashed trains into one of them at a number of different speeds, getting pretty damn fast, uh, before using the same one, covering it in oil and setting it on fire. And it, it wasn't breached. They didn't actually have you know, fuel in it or anything, but they had detectors to see if it was breached, and it wasn't. So short of probably a, a decently sized explosion, these things aren't going to be leaking radioactive waste and poison, poisoning us anytime soon. But that being said, they, you know, it's not a long-term solution, which is fair enough. Um, however, however um, long-term solutions do uh, Against, con uh, against popular belief actually exist. Um, in fact, nuclear engineers, they, they take their inspiration from a, uh, a, a natural phenomenon. Um, once upon a time in uh, Gabon, uh, there were some French, uh, French guys working for a, a nuclear company that went to see if there was any nuclear fuel around here that they could use. And um, they found that actually there, there was much less uranium here than they expected, as in there was of the sort of uranium that they would find useful. There was about five nuclear bombs worth less of it than they expected. This was because um, two billion years ago, a nuclear reactor, a natural nuclear reactor had occurred underground. And um, this has been a fantastic sort of case study for examining how nuclear waste behaves when you just throw it in the ground in an ignorant sort of way. And as it turns out, all the plutonium, all of the other crap that will emerge from turning on a nuclear reactor in spite of being 20 meters below ground, it didn't move more than you know, four or five meters in two billion years. Um, so what nuclear engineers do is they take that to the extreme. Instead of putting it 20 meters underground, they put nuclear waste 500 meters underground. Instead of just throwing it in as it stands straight out of a reactor, they cover it in four independent sort of layers of protection. And this thing is designed to last um, half a million years. It'll probably last a lot longer than that. Um, so people often say that there's no solution to the nuclear waste problem. These people are lying to you because this exists and is being built in Finland and in Korea and I think in Switzerland. And um, well, there was a, a study done on, on this uh, deep, <coughs> deep geological repository in Finland. It was, it, it was government backed. And it found that even if all of these layers of protection cracked, even if you know, plutonium was leaking straight out of that thing, a person living right on top, right bang in the middle of it, if he was living on that sort of uh, one square meter, like the most exposed square meter, his radiation dose as a result of this would be equivalent to eating one extra bunch of bananas in a year. Um, <laughs> this, this may, this may you know, seem somewhat controversial in that the study was government backed, but I, I never thought I would see the day until three days ago when I discovered this quote from Greenpeace, who independently evaluated this study and found that uh, there's no proof so far that the planned repository is not safe, in spite of all of their other literature saying there is no solution to this problem. So um, yeah, I would say we do a pretty decent job of taking care of our waste. But the question is, how does that compare? I mean, it's meaningless to talk about waste and dealing with it, but how does that compare to to sources of waste from other energy sources because everything in this is a trade-off. And um, coal, obviously, it produces a lot of waste. Hello, Ben. It produces a lot of waste that goes uh, straight up the chimney um, and a lot of uh, solid waste that's left behind. But say solar waste, um, how, how does nuclear compare to that? Oh, oh, shit, I skipped ahead one. 
well, anyway, I'll go back to that. Solar waste, if you compare it to how we deal with nuclear waste at the moment, um, Mark Nelson, a, uh, a, with whom a lot of you may be familiar, in his current uh, job, he compared the two, solar waste and nuclear waste, and found that if you compare the volumes of waste, uh, there's 300 times more solar waste than nuclear. And maybe this doesn't sound so bad because it's solar, it's benign, it's, you know, it's natural. Except that if you eat cadmium or if you eat uranium, your body's not going to care much. Um, you, you, will still, uh, you will still respond badly. Um, so I would say if anyone's talking about waste, uh, as far as nuclear is concerned, they are trying to mislead you. It is not actually a problem. Um, a fun fact, if you generated energy from both nuclear power plants and solar plants, the same amount of energy that we're currently generating from nuclear, if you did that for 25 years, stacked all the waste in a football field, a football field sort of area, the height of the nuclear waste would reach the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The height of the solar waste would be the same as Mount Everest. So it's, uh, you know, don't, don't get too hung up on the waste is what I would say. Skipping back briefly, I, I will also say that in principle, uh, a lot of people say that just throwing waste in the ground in a repository is in itself a waste because this waste contains a lot of uranium. It contains a lot of plutonium, which you can put straight back in a nuclear reactor and get more energy out of, a lot more energy out of. Um, but you get about, what, 5% out of it now, and in principle, you can get 95% out of it or something. But if you actually reprocess that waste, took the good stuff out, put it back in a reactor, the sort of energy utilization in running nuclear reactors becomes tremendous, such that all of the high-level waste that you would generate over the course of your energy-using lifetime, you could hold it in your hand. Well, you shouldn't hold it in your hands, but you could hold it in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the liberty of presuming that um, people might be concerned about the relationship between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, and justifiably so, because nuclear weapons are bad. Um, but um, how exactly are they linked? And how, how has it come to be that they, they could be so linked? Well, the question sort of, it, um, it relies on knowing a little bit about how nuclear weapons are made, and there are two recipes. The first uses highly enriched uranium. So when you dig uranium out of the ground, um, there are two isotopes in it. There's uranium-235, which is good for splitting and maintaining a, a chain reaction. There's uranium-238, which is n not so good for splitting. So you need to enrich this. You need to make more or have more uranium-235 in your fuel or in your bomb. The way to do this is to turn, it into, turn the uranium into a gas and stick this gas in centrifuges such as these. Um, you then sp spin the centrifuges and the lighter isotope, the uranium-235, comes off preferentially preferentially. And um, for a nuclear reactor, the fuel that goes into it, it's about 3% enrichment. So you need a, a moderate number of centrifuges. For a nuclear bomb, you need about 90% enrichment. So you need a lot of centrifuges, enough centrifuges that you can spot them from space if you haven't already detected the, uh, the large volume of very finely manufactured uh, steel cylinders that have been purchased, <laughs> um, or the huge energy use to run these damn things. So. Um, this is what, uh, for, for, for the record, this is sort of the approach that people suspected Iran was taking and is no longer taking because they've limited the number of centrifuges they can use and aren't making bombs. The other way to do it is to produce plutonium. And I confess, to produce plutonium, you do need a nuclear reactor. However, to produce it in a commercial nuclear reactor would be tricky. This is because commercial nuclear reactors um, they burn up fuel pretty quickly. And plutonium, if you want to make a decent bomb, it needs to be quite pure. So what you would have to do if we wanted to make weapons material out of Hinkley Point, you would need to stick the fuel in the reactor, turn it on for about maybe half a day, a day, something like that. Turn it off, spend half a month refueling it, do the same immediately after, all while being very obviously detectable, at least to the US, from when you know, you're, you're um, cooling water is coming out of your reactor, if not to the general population because of the blackouts. Um, so making plutonium is it's much easier than investing in a huge energy resource. You can do it by buying uh, nuclear-grade graphite off Alibaba. Um, however, I should say that um, one thing you, you don't often hear from people that are 
against nuclear weapons, the campaign for nuclear disarmament, for example. They have never once said that nuclear reactors are probably the best way of getting rid of nuclear weapons material. This is because nuclear weapons material makes fantastic fuel for a nuclear reactor, such that um, in the uh, megatons to megawatts program, up to 10% of US electricity for, for quite a long time, it might have stopped very recently, but for quite a long time was coming from Soviet warheads. So I don't know, I would say on the whole, nuclear energy is probably more of a, a benefit as far as proliferation is concerned. But um, now I, uh, I come to very briefly try and convince you of the necessity of nuclear energy. I mean, nuclear energy is pretty cool, but I'm increasingly convinced that it's more than that. It's, it's actually quite vital if we, we care about fighting climate change while also maintaining you know, lights in the room. Um, so I will uh, first say that there are people out there, unsurprisingly, who say we can run the whole world on 100% renewable energy. Uh, Greenpeace, for example, in this uh, Energy Revolution report, it's, a, it's an excellent read. Um, <laughs> it's a very good read. Um, because uh, one uh, notable thing is that this is for 2050. And in 2050, they say that we can run on 100% renewable energy while using um, only 80% of the energy that we used in 2010. Um, this is in spite of an increased population. Um, this is, of course, covered by efficiency. Watch out for the word efficiency when people are proposing 100% renewable solutions because this means um, not driving, not flying, not you know, things like that. So. But um, another interesting thing about Greenpeace's energy utopia is it's not, it's not exactly equal um, because in this outlook, uh, North America and Africa are allocated roughly the same amount of energy in spite of, in 2050, Africa having five times the population of North America. I mean, no, th this is no big deal because, you know, Africa's not the ones that pay Greenpeace's uh, donor base. So on the other hand, um, a slightly more considered approach was that taken by the late, great uh, David Mackay, who was uh, formerly the Regis Professor of Engineering here in Cambridge and also the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Department of Energy and Climate Change while it was still a thing. And um, he, uh, he took issue with people saying every little bit helps um, because climate change, it's, it's an uphill battle. We need a lot of clean energy and we need it pretty quickly. But people say if you turn off your mobile phone charger, you're, you're in the fight against climate change. You're not. Um, <laughs> So this book is, well, it's very highly readable. I would recommend anyone, anyone to look it up as long as you know, you're not terrified by arithmetic. And it's sort of, the first part of it tots up the, uh, the energy consumed by the average sort of moderately affluent um, British person and compares it to the energy uh, conceivably within the bound, the uppermost bounds of physics the energy conceivably produced by all uh, green, clean, traditionally, um, resources of, of energy. Um, he does this with very simple back-of-the-envelope cal calculations. It's approximate, but it gives you an indication of sort of what we're up against. So in doing this, um, on the left, we have sort of the... I apologize. This is a, a low-resolution image. I, I couldn't make it much better. But on the left, we have sort of all of the... Uh, contributions to a person's daily energy demand. So we've got heat, for example, is huge. Um, cars, maybe not, maybe not here in Cambridge, but cars on average. Um, just stuff, the embodied energy in having a mobile phone is, uh, I'm told, like having a fridge, apparently. And that's compared against, on the right, um, the amount of energy conceivably produced uh, by, all, um, by all renewables. It doesn't look so bad, does it? I mean. You know, it's, it's maybe a little bit over, but we're close. You know, a bit more efficiency, a bit less stuff, we could do it. Um, sadly, uh, probably not. Because for, say, the solar farms there and the uh, wind at the bottom, uh, each of those is given 5% of the UK land area to cover. Um, for a couple of reasons, this probably isn't going to happen. Um, it also doesn't consider the cost of them or, indeed, the fact that they're intermittent and maybe maybe won't we won't have 
electricity all the time if we do this. So aware of this uh, techno-optimism, um, Mackay also included some estimates from slightly uh, more rigorous estimates from reputable bodies. So note the Greenpeace isn't included. However, the Institute of Electrical Engineers, for example, is. And um, things are looking uh, just a little bit more sparse. Um, if we want, well, if we want to go all renewables, then we need to stop doing a lot of things. Um, we need a lot less heat, a lot less intercontinental flights, um, a lot less stuff, as, as Mackay puts it. Our lifestyles are going to change. And if you think this is realistic, then consider um, the politics of it. When's the last time that politicians have voted to disimprove our quality of life? Well, maybe that's arguable. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of energy, we'll say. Um, so on the other hand, we need something to fill those gaps. If we actually care about climate change, then it won't be fossil fuels. If there's anything other than nuclear, I would love to hear it. Um, things are going to be tough. Um, but, and sorry, I should say, you know, this is only for a subset of the world, but calculations like these are, uh, are not, not uncommon across the rest of the world. However, in spite of truly a polymath was David Mackay, um, showing that it, it's not going to be as easy as that. Um, there have been, and there continue to be, a lot of academics with very nice titles and professorships saying that, we, oh, we definitely, we certainly can do 100% renewables. It's very much feasible. Um, for example, one Stanford professor, uh, Mark Jacobson, who, um, as far as I'm concerned, is little more than a, an Excel sheet warrior. But um, <laughs> in spite of having been, uh, there's, Great article, a great article in um, New York Times about this, actually. In, in spite of having been sort of very dramatically shown to have been wrong and, uh, well, wrong in a number of places, uh, certainly in terms of arithmetic, in terms of understanding electricity markets, in, in terms of assumptions, uh, one being that the US can increase its uh, hydroelectric capacity by a factor of 16, which um, isn't going to happen. Um, and another being that we can't use nuclear because if we have nuclear, then every 30 years there will be a recurring nuclear war. Um, yeah, yeah, hopefully you can comment on that now yourselves. Um, in spite of having been shown to be very dramatically wrong by orders of magnitude, he still has recently actually published scenarios for 100% renewables for 139 other countries. Uh, he's similarly generous to Africa as is Greenpeace. Um, but uh, this gets a lot of headlines saying 100% renewables can save the world, stop climate change, um, especially when you say it can make jobs in the process, which um, is maybe a little bit dubious. However, headlines generate endorsements. Uh, for example, Mark Ruffalo and Leonardo DiCaprio directly quote this fella. These, this is where it's, it sort of gets dangerous being enumerate in that um, <laughs> these celebrity endorsements then evoke political endorsements. For example, um, Jerry Brown in California, who uh, has said that, oh, because this guy Mark Jacobson says nuclear is bad and we need all renewables, I'm going to shut down Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor. This is equivalent to scrapping all of the solar plants that exist in California. Similarly, Bernie Sanders. He said that because this guy, Mark Jacobson, says we can live on 100% renewables, I'll turn off the Vermont Yankee. This was greater than 75% of the clean energy in Vermont. So I guess, ultimately, what this talk is trying to demonstrate is that we need nuclear. Um, we need to be numerate. It's not as simple as saying 100% renewables will do everything. To quote David Mackay, uh, I'm not pro-nuclear, I'm pro-arithmetic. I mean, I actually am pro-nuclear because it's pretty cool. <laughs> but we need to think about the numbers. So thank you very much. <laughs>